Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. We're going to be reading particularly verses 1 through 9. Verses 1 through 9. Now let me give you a little uh, Bible trivia. From this passage until Numbers chapter 10, Israel is based at Mount Sinai. That's a long time. That's about 60-ish chapters. And they're there to answer one question. How does a holy God dwell with an unholy people? Exodus 19 and Exodus 20 is going to give us broad outlines to answer this question. To allow us to see God's relationship with us and his intention behind it. In a, in a word, God enters into covenant with us because God has a plan for us. So let's take that up in our sermon in a sentence. Great privilege produces great duty. Great privilege produces great duty. Let us pray and then we'll read. Heavenly Father, what a gift it is that you have given us your word. That you've given us the ministry of your church and of this pulpit to proclaim your word and your promises to us. May we receive it with diligence and prayer and preparation, with faith and love. May we lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. To the glory of God, in Christ's name I pray, amen. We're going to start in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai. And they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and that you may believe forever. And thus ends the reading of God's word this morning. Let me tell you a little story. Some of you all might know part of this story. I used to work on a plant nursery, sold plants for a living. And one day I saw this beautiful young lady come in and we locked eyes, but I didn't get to talk to her. My responsibilities toward this woman was zero. But she came back. And I got to talk to her. And we started dating. And eventually we got married. And don't you believe my responsibilities toward her skyrocketed? This wedding ring means I am duty bound to take the trash out every Wednesday for the rest of my life. <laughs> but with that duty comes great privilege. Duty and, respond, duty and privilege rise and fall together. 
And we, we understand this instinctively, don't we? We are, we are more duty bound to the United States of America than, say, Mexico, because we receive no privileges from Mexico, but we receive privileges from being a United States citizen. And so we have more responsibilities. Now, when we look at our covenant, at our text, we see the same thing. We see a covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement with certain promises and obligations. A covenant is an agreement with certain promises and obligations. As I mentioned, reading Psalm 25, the God of heaven has come down and bound himself to us with many great and precious promises. Wow. And connected with this, he lays out obligations or duties to come with this great privilege. Herman Bovink says it like this. The covenant of God imposes obligations, not as conditions, for we are brought into the covenant by his compassion. But these obligations, these duties, show us how people in the covenant are to conduct their lives. What's he trying to say here? That God gives us a great privilege, but he gives us obligations. He gives us duties to show us how to live this life. Now in Christianity, this gets cattywampus. We all know what cattywampus means. It gets out of sorts. I'll tell you how. There's two ways. First, there is a Christian that's all privilege and no duty. You all have met this Christian. They sing this hymn. Free from the law, blessed condition, I can sin all I want and still have remission. That is one side. But on the other hand, you have the Christian that's all, du all duty and no privilege. They say, I must do X, Y, and Z so that God loves me. One of them, the first one makes you an antinomian, which means anti-law, anti-duty. The second makes you a legalist. Both of them fundamentally misunderstand God and the nature of God's covenant. God's covenant is where privilege and duty kiss. We must keep these things together. So let's make a very fundamental statement. Great privilege produces great duty. Great privilege produces great duty. What is the privilege that produces duty? And what is the duty that privilege produces? What is the privilege? What is the duty? Let's dive first into the privilege. Why? Because that's what God does. Notice God lays out privileges before he asks of us anything. He gives us three. The first privilege is that we are purchased. God says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. This is what we call a historical prologue. It tells us how the two parties come together. I like to illustrate it like this. You go to a wedding. And usually the bride and groom have a table with pictures on it. And it starts way out here. And you have pictures of them as babies. And then in kindergarten. And then in middle school. And then high school. And then when they met. Those pictures are describing how they came to know each other. How they came to be in a relationship. In the same way God is reminding them. Do you remember where our relationship started. Do you remember when I redeemed you from the affliction and oppression of Egypt? You see, at that point in time, Israel had no way out. They were digging a hole, and the walls were caving in. And around them, the air was getting thin, and they weren't digging it. But then God came, and he saved them. They never experienced something like this before. They had never been able to call a place home before God. And in a moment, he washed away the reproach of Egypt. The yoke of slavery was gone. Their redemption was accomplished. He had purchased their freedom. Now remember, 
Redemption is a term the winners use. Pharaoh was not redeemed. Pharaoh was condemned. Israel was redeemed. They were God's chosen people. Repeatedly, God says, I will redeem you. I have redeemed you. What God is telling them is that he saved them from judgment through judgment by purchasing their redemption. Doesn't that picture our relationship with Jesus Christ? We were saved from God's judgment because Christ bore our judgment and purchased our redemption. We are a people purchased. Privilege number one. Privilege number two, we are preserved. We are purchased and we are preserved. I love how God says this. He says, you have seen how I have borne you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now get the imagery here. You got an eagle sitting on top of a cliff and mama bird gives the baby a little nudge and the bird flies out of the nest. And as the fledgling bird is on his way to becoming a pancake, Mama swoops down under him and carries this bird back to the nest. She carries the bird to be back with herself. Isn't that an absolute beautiful picture of God's preservation of us? The psalmist says that if the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, if the Lord had not been on our side when people rose up against us, the flood would have swept us away. We would have gone under the raging water. God preserved them. When they had no water, boom, God provided water. They had no food, God provided food. When the Amalekites attacked the weakest people of Israel, boom, God defended them over and over. If the Lord had not been on their side, their goose would have been cooked. And don't we see this today? There's a story of David Brainerd, the missionary to the Indians. These Indians come, tomahawks in hand, and they open the flap of his tent, and they see a man on his knees praying. And a rattlesnake goes across his feet. He was in some intense prayer. And the rattlesnake rears up to strike David. And all of a sudden, the rattlesnake lays down and moves on by. And when the Indians see this, they say, He has been preserved by the Great Spirit. So when David Brainerd comes to this Indian village weeks later, he is honored when he expected to be killed. Why? Because they had heard the reports of how God preserved him. God preserved his worker for such a task. And what about us? Hasn't God preserved us? Think about the near misses in our lives, and we're still here. How about the, all the times help has come in just the nick of time? What about all the seemingly impossibilities that have unfolded right before our very eyes? Has not God preserved us for such a time as this, for such a work as this? With this great privilege comes a great duty. But let's think about the third privilege. We've been purchased, we've been preserved, and we have been possessed. We have been possessed. God says, you are my treasured possession of all peoples. All the earth is mine. Abraham Kuyper was a pastor, theologian, and prime minister. And he makes this comment. There is not a square inch of this entire world where Christ does not look at it and say, mine. Now, as much as I want to affirm that statement, there's a special way in which God looks at his people. 
at his church, and he says, mine. It's the age-old dilemma. What do you buy a man that has everything? We deal with this problem every year. For God, who has everything, he purchased a people. Christ says in the book of, in, in the book of Ephesians that he loved the church and he gave himself up for her. She is his possession, his bride. To be purchased at such a price, to be preserved at such a cost, to be possessed by such a God, it leads us to sing with Samuel Rutherford, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He brings a poor, vile sinner into his house of wine. If we are God's most treasured possession, will he not give us all things? Will he not bring us into his house of wine? Will he not fill us with more joy and peace than when the world's grain abounds? Will he not ensure that we dwell with him forever? Not just in heaven, but right now. Right now in the midst of this world. I mean, listen to me for a minute. We all know old men with old cars or big trucks that refuse to get them dirty. But they wash them every weekend. Why? It's their treasured possession. They care for it. Now I want you to look at us. If, I was, if we were trucks, God takes us off-road sometimes, doesn't he? We're busy. We're busier than a moth and a mitten. And guess what? We are God's treasured possession. He takes great care of us. I've been just amazed at the weather recently and how beautiful everything is budding out and blooming. And I look at the care that God gives this world and it pales in comparison to the care God has for us because we are his treasured possession. But there's a problem, isn't there? God purchased us, God preserves us, and God possesses us. If we were trucks, we would all be a lemon. We don't just have a problem. We are a problem. We sin, we fall, we fail, we make mistakes. Don't we see this in Israel? Moses says, if I can paraphrase, all right, Israel, you heard what God has said. What do you think? And Israel says, no problem. We got it. How'd that work out for them? Need I remind you of the golden calves? And I'm not talking about the golden calves in Exodus 32. I'm talking about the, the golden calves of Jeroboam. When he put golden calves in Dan and Bethel, like he didn't see how that worked out in Exodus 32. Like he didn't learn his lesson. And don't we do the same things? We find ourselves stuck and plagued with the same sins of our youth. The same perennial temptations occur over and over again. It never fails me. How many times we start a conversation like this? Well, I should have. Well, I, I knew I should have done that. We start a lot of sentences with shoulda, woulda, and coulda. We say these things to our spouses, to our parents, to our friends and families, and we say these things to our God because we sin, we fall, we fail. But does God fail? Does God's faithfulness depend upon ours? You see, my friends, I do something with my child that my wife does not approve of. I like to spin her in circles. That's the thing that fathers do that make every mother squeamish. Because what they see is that kid is barely holding on. She's going to go flying across the yard any second. But what's important is not the grip of the child. It's my grip. It's daddy's grip. In the same way, we look at the covenant and we go, God, I have blown it. But what is important is not our faithfulness. It is his faithfulness.
We were purchased, we were preserved, and we are possessed by his faithfulness. Paul says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Even in Jeremiah 14, Israel looks at God and they go, God, we have blown it. We have sinned. We have broken our end of the bargain. We have broken your covenant. But then they say this wonderful line, but Lord, remember and do not break your covenant. Lord, be faithful when we are not. And the Lord has been faithful. He sent Jesus Christ to us who fulfilled all the ends of the covenant that we have dropped the ball on. And he bore our punishment. Peter says that we have been ransomed, that we have been purchased from the feudal ways inherited from our forefathers, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As Bernard of Clairvaux says, You have loved me more than yourself, for you did lay down your life for me. Isn't it a great privilege to be loved so faithfully? Now we find ourselves back where we started, don't we? Great privilege requires great Great privilege produces great duty. And you may say to yourself, well, if God's going to be faithful, well, I could just sin all I want and still have remission. Well, that's not how it works. Peter says you have been purchased from the feudal ways of your forefathers. That this God who has purchased, possessed, and preserved and possesses you will sanctify you. That he will make you willing and able to rise to this great duty. This privilege produces something. It produces a duty. What is this duty? Well, God says, you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We are to represent God to a lost and dying world. And this world is lost and dying. He says we are to be a kingdom of priests. Every believer in the New Testament is a priest. So what does that mean? It means that our duty comes down to what we do with our lives. Our duty comes down to what we do in our lives. God has set us apart, not stowed us away. Our mission is to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ and to pray for this lost and dying world. This duty re requires intentionality, purpose, and execution. We must know, we must care, and we must do. We must be a line into this world. God did not shackle the gospel to the borders of Israel, and God has not shackled his gospel to the four walls of this church. God has called us to be a kingdom of priests, a light unto the nations. It means praying. It means pursuing. Who are we praying for that does not know Christ? Surely we know somebody. And who are we pursuing? Who are we bringing the word of Christ to? Someone once told me a line by Frank Barker that said, sometimes you've got to love people long enough for them to ask why. Who are we praying for and who are we pursuing as a kingdom of priests? But not only are we a kingdom of priests, we are a holy nation. Our duty is not just with what we do with our lives. Our duty involves how we live our lives. God's going to spend 60 plus chapters describing how a holy God dwells with a holy people. The answer, we've been brought into God's holy presence and our lives are to reflect that reality. In a word, God says, you will obey my voice and keep my covenant. As our own catechism says, 
What is the duty that God requires of man? The duty of which God requires of man is obedience to his revealed will. You go on the Autobahn in Germany and the speed limit, I think, is 81 miles per hour. I dare you to drive 81 miles per hour in front of my office and see what happens. You see, the revealed will of Raymond and the revealed will of Germany are two different things. And we are to live in accordance with the revealed will of whose nation we belong. Our citizenship has consequences. Liberty has limitations to be expressed in obedience and worship. Peter says, look, put away all malice, slander, envy, deceit, hypocrisy. These belong to your forefathers. You have been purchased, bought with a price. Don't act like those people. You are God's people. Our peoplehood has consequences. If I could be very blunt for a moment. God did not go through such great lengths to purchase, preserve, and possess us that we could act like hooligans on earth and saints in heaven. God calls us to act like saints now, to be a holy nation. If we look like the world, talk like the world, and walk like the world, guess what? We're probably the world. There are certain policies and practices a Christian should have no involvement in. The privileges bestowed upon us produce a certain duty in our lives, and it comes through holiness and thought, word, and deed. So we must ask ourselves, am I living like one who is a citizen of a holy nation? Do I reflect the holiness of my King, Jesus Christ? In conclusion, I want to read a quote by C.S. Lewis. He says this. I'm going to paraphrase. Christians are in a different position from people trying to be good. Some people try to be good to please God, and if there's not a God, they just try to win the approval of men. But the Christian believes he is good because of Christ living inside of him. That God will make us good because he loves us. Just as the roof of a greenhouse does not attract the sun because it's bright, but it becomes bright because the sun shines on it. Do you understand what he's saying? You don't become lovely so that God will love you. You become lovely because God loves you. The Christian life gets cattywampus when we put duty before privilege. We must receive these great privileges before we engage in these great duties. Have you experienced the privileges that come from knowing Jesus Christ? Have you experienced that freedom of redemption, the ease of our conscience? Have you experienced the sweet joys found in faith? If you have not, you are a slave. And God extends his arms to you and says, Come to me. I have purchased you. I will preserve you. And I will possess you. Now, on the other hand, if you have enjoyed this privilege, it, require, it produces a great duty. To them who has been given much, much more is expected. Are we being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation? Are we praying? Are we pursuing? Are we living lives marked with a marked difference from the world. My friends, the church has lost much of its efficacy in our day and age because the world cannot tell the difference. God has blessed us with so much, and he's put it for a purpose. And that purpose is to serve him, to love him, to obey him. So I ask you, my friends, Today is the day that we play the man and fulfill the duties that this great privilege has given us. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have called us to a monumental task, but that you have promised us
that you would sanctify us, that you would strengthen us by your Spirit, that you would will and work in us until that great day when Christ returns. Father, will you work in us today that we may shed your light to Raymond and around the world. Father, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.